Good evening, and uh, I welcome you all to another CPD event hosted by Sri Lanka College of Specialist Family Physicians. Uh, today's topic is recognition and management of pediatric growth disorders in primary care settings. Pediatric growth, growth, uh, pediatric growth disorders um, give unique challenges in primary care settings because it requires comprehensive understanding of normal growth patterns and uh, timely recognition of uh, the deviations and also appropriate management strategies. So um, I hope this lecture will be helpful to all of you and uh, you will be able to learn some important facts about pediatric growth disorders and also to understand some key concepts and how to diagnose those and uh, to learn some evidence-based interventions uh, suitable for uh, primary care practitioners. So let me introduce today's resource person, Dr. Imalka Kankana Prachi. Uh, he is an experienced pediatrician um, holding uh, MBBS, MD Pediatrics, DCH, MRC-PCH and MRCP. And Dr. Imalka serves as the Senior Lecturer in Pediatrics at the Faculty of Medicine, University of Rohona, uh, while also contributing as a consultant pediatrician at uh, Teaching Hospital Karapitiya. So before we begin, um, let me uh, tell you some housekeeping rules. Uh, so please make sure to rename yourself with a Zoom name, which is similar to which should be appear in the participation certificate. And uh, towards the end of the lecture, a link will be shared in the chat box. Please fill it out. And please note that uh, attending the lecture for minimum 45 minutes and completing this form is necessary to uh, obtain the certificate. And this Google form will consist of three, uh, seven multiple uh, choice questions in which you have to uh, select uh, true, uh, only uh, true answers in the check boxes. Uh, the correct answers will be uh, appear to you uh, just after you submit the Google form. Uh, and uh, please make sure that you keep your microphones muted throughout the session, not to be a disturbance to others. And uh, if you have any questions, kindly type them in the chat box. Uh, then uh, Dr. Imalka will address those later. And even after the uh, after his lecture, after his uh, session, you can ask even unmute your mics and ask your uh, questions from him. So um, I think uh, Dr. Imalka, uh, now uh, over to you, sir. Right. Uh, thank you very much uh, for giving this opportunity and the kind words of introduction. So um, I thought to discuss the recognition and management of pediatric growth disorders in primary care settings. When I was asked to deliver a lecture to you, I thought to do this because um, rather than going into the depth of these growth disorders, I thought to give an overview, when to refer and when to reassure. So those are the two main aims in this uh, um, lecture, as well as if we are going to do reassuring, how are we going to arrange the follow-up? So this will be the uh, key message at the end of this lecture. So, uh, so the plan of the talk will be like this. So I'll be discussing with the growth phases in children. I'm not going to spend a lot for that. It's mainly theory-based thing. And then it's important to know the growth patterns in children because it's not similar. I mean, it's different in different different time periods of the childhood. And then the popular name uh, will discuss something about failure to thrive. And then as children go, grow, when they come to school age, we talk about short stature. And then we have obesity and overweight as a problem and a little bit on tall stature as well. And then lastly, puberty related disorders. So we'll start with growth phases in children. There are four main growth phases in human. So the first phase is called fetal growth phase. The second one is called in infantile growth phase, then childhood growth phase and the pubertal growth spurt. So out of these four growth phases, I mean, different factors determine different growth phases. Now, let's look at each growth phase. Um, so this diagram will give you an overview about 
Now in the y axis, you have got adult height. In the x axis, you have got number of years. Now if you look at different growth phases in different colors, in the pur purple color, you have fetal growth phase. So 30% of your final height is coming with your fetal life, fetal growth. And then the infantile growth phase, 15% of your final height is coming with the infantile growth phase. And the childhood growth phase is the longest growth phase, uh, which will give you about 40% of the final height. And the pubertal growth phase is the last growth phase. Afterwards, children will not grow anymore in the same way height wise so it's mainly the height what matters not the weight because the weight acquisition may be the fat distribution i mean deposition rather than the bone uh, maturity yeah so let's discuss one by one so the fetal growth phase is the fastest period within the period of nine months you can imagine 30 percent of your eventual height is gained in this period so average newborn babies length is 50 centimeters if you take 150 centimeter old person so that means 30 percent has come during the fetal life so the factors affecting fetal growth are like size of the mother the birth order and the placental nutrition supply and growth factors like insulin like growth factor 2 human placental lactogen and insulin what is important here is you can see thyroxine is not here, growth hormone is not here, sex hormones are not here. So it's it's totally different type of factors important in the fetal growth phase. So with this fetal growth, what will happen at birth? A baby will be born with this birth length of average 50 centimeters. The birth weight will be 2.5 to 3.5. The head circumference will be 35 centimeters. And it's important to know the chest circumference at birth is less than the head circumference. But when it comes to adults, it's... And also, upper segment to lower segment ratio is an important assessment when it comes to the short stretch evaluation. So at birth, the upper segment is 1.7 times the lower segment. Um, so all these are these proportions are important to remember. Then the infantile growth phase, although we say infant is defined as less than one year, when it comes to the growth phase, we take it up to 18 months. So the 15% of the adult height is coming in this period. But it's a rapid but decelerating growth rate. If you look at the growth charts in our CHTR, you can see the line is curving downwards. The natural growth is also like that. So change fetal length to genetically determined height during this period. And this is the period where the external factors come into the picture, like the nutrition, good health, happiness, and thyroid hormone. And still you can see the growth hormone and sex hormones are not included. It doesn't mean that they are not important at all, but they have some contribution. But if someone is not growing during this period, what you need to think is nutrition and thyroid hormones and uh, the happiness and the intercurrent in infections. So then you get the childhood growth phase, which is the longest growth phase and the 40% of the final height is coming during this period. And in this period, growth hormone has a huge role to play and also thyroid hormone, good health and happiness and the nutrition will be there during all four growth phases, I would say. And in the pubertal growth phase, mainly it's due to the testosterone and estrogen hormones. And the 15% of your final height is coming in this period. But at the end of this pubertal growth phase, the bones will be fully matured, which will result in a proficient closure. Therefore, if someone attain early puberty, the final height will be low. So that's, why, that's one reason why we need to attain early puberty, children with early puberty. 
and then during this period other than sex hormones growth hormone also has a role so these are the four growth phases so in summary the fetal growth phase will give you 30 percent infantile growth phase will give you 15 percent similarly pubertal growth phase will give you 15 percent and the rest of the 30 percent height gain is coming with your infantile so childhood growth phase and if you get a child with some mainly the height problem or the short stature or the length uh, problem with the length you can think about what are the factors which would have contributed to this particular problem in that particular age group right so then it's extremely important to know how to assess this growth because we as doctors will have to do these measurements I find we have shortcuts when we assess growth parameters. Therefore, sometimes we might end up in errors in the final anthropometric record. So it's important to know how to correctly measure the height and weight. So ideally speaking, we need to have a tool like this. It's called stadiometer. So it should be a wall mounted to be well calibrated and something similar to this in all the hospitals we have this at the moment and i have seen the same thing in the private hospitals as well in gp practice if you can afford for such a thing it will be uh i mean that's the best rather than pasting a tape on the wall uh, so it's not that accurate and I'm not going to go into the detail of this five-point touch, but if you are checking the height properly, you should maintain this five-point touch in the uh, back. So that is height, but most challenging is the length measurement. Um, so in most hospitals and most GP practices and most private, private hospitals, we don't have this length measuring tool which is called infantometer um so it, it's there has to be three essential components an attached yards and a fixed head plate and a movable foot plate so sometimes i have seen the modified versions of this i think they are not that bad provided that you keep the baby on the hard surface ever ever check the length of a baby on top of the bed because the it, it, you will get uh, falsely low values if you do like that. So you have to do it on a hard surface always. Ideally speaking, you need to have two people, but always you can get the help of the mother. Now, without checking these anthropometric measurements appropriately, there's no point in commenting on growth parameters in children. So that's why it's important to have these tools in your practices. Now, if you look at the height versus length, we change this at the age of two years. So length to height change at two years because if you take the length, it's slightly higher than the height. After two years, it's always the height. But in rare occasions where children with disabilities, like cerebral palsy children uh, and children who could not stand properly, um, like children sometimes with meningomyelocele, we might have to use the length or the height uh, instead of the height even after uh, two years of age. But you need to know the length is slightly higher than the height. There's a formula as well, which is of no use actually. Right. Now, if you want to check the weight of a baby, the baby should be on the, uh, I mean, the baby should be naked. And there are different types of uh, weighing scales are there, beam balance, spring balance, then the bathroom scale. Um, so you need to use the appropriate tool for the respective age. Right, so then what I will do is I will run through some of the scenarios and based on that, I will do my talk. So this is the scenario one. 
A seven day old baby girl was brought by the primary mother with a concern of excessive cry. This is a very common presenting complaint. The baby was born at term with a, uh, with a birth weight of three kilograms. The antenatal and perinatal periods were uneventful. Um, on examination, the baby looks well, no fever, but the current weight is 2.5 kilograms. So you need to have a proper tool to get this weight, otherwise the whole purpose of this consultation is lost. So if you calculate the weight loss, the 16.6% weight loss, now what to do? So that is the question. Now let's look at what will happen to the weight of the baby within first 10 days. So it's normal for them to drop the weight up to 10%. Which means if it is a three kilo baby, the weight drop up to 2.7 is affordable or it is physiological. But you might see more than that in babies who are born to diabetic mothers. In such a situation, sometimes we might allow beyond the 10% weight drop as well. Uh, we what we usually expect is for them to get the birth weight by about 10 to 14 days. But if you see a baby with more than 10% weight loss during first two weeks, definitely you can't manage it in the GP setup, GP practice. It needs a pediatrician's review. Pediatrician will also have to admit this baby for further evaluation. It may be highly likely a feeding problem or sometimes occult infections can give rise to this problem. Now, during the first month, we can't use the growth chart because we will have to frequently monitor the weight. Now, after the baby gets the birth weight by about 10 to 14 days, thereafter the usual average recommended weight gain is about 20 to 30 grams per day. Roughly, we say around 200 per week. Now assume this baby who came to you had only 7% weight loss and you thought to review this baby in two weeks time. By that time, your aim is to get around 400 grams weight in this month, right? So you can't use the same figure in all ages because as babies grow older, the average weight gain per week is very low compared to the weight gain in the first month. So this baby needs to be referred to a pediatrician. You can't manage this baby. Right. So let's look at growth pattern during infancy. What will happen to the weight? Now, in case if they do not bring a growth chart with them, sometimes the mom, mother might ask, okay, doctor, whether this baby's weight is good or not. You can't give any opinion without check, putting it on the CHDR, but roughly you need to know these figures. The birth weight doubles by five months. If a baby is born with three kilograms by about five months, the baby should be about six kilograms and triples by 12 months. That means three kilo baby at birth will be nine kilos by about one month and quadruples by two years means by about two years, the baby will be 12 kilos. So that's what happens to the weight. And let's look at what happens to the height or length. Um, so usual birth length is 50 centimeters, but one by about one year, the height or the length will be 75 centimeters. And so which means 25 centimeter length gain in the first year. And in the second year, 12.5 centimeter length or height gain. So around four years of age, the height will be one meter. So 400, uh, sorry, 100 centimeters. So roughly, you can think the final adult height will be the two times of the height of the second year. Right? It's a rough figure. It's, it's not always correct, but it is a rough value, right? Right. Now, let's move on to this scenario. This is a very common scenario. Um, a seven-month-old baby was brought by his mother with a concern of poor weight gain. 
the mother was advised by the midwife to show her baby to a doctor because of the persistent low birth weight. Now, midwives are so vigilant and uh, they used to, they are very, I mean, the sensitivity wise, they are very high. I think it's good. It's it, it's one of the strength in our primary health care system. But now this growth pattern, the baby birth weight was 2.35 and the current weight is 5.5. .5. This baby lies always in the orange zone, which means minus 2 SD to minus 3 SD. In Singhala, it says Adubara. So what will happen? Now, see, this baby will belong in this. Now, every time the midwives used to blame the mom because you are not feeding the baby well, because of that, the baby is in the adubara zone, the low weight zone. But rest of the clinical examination is unremarked. And let's look at the next chart, which is very important in this case, what happened to the length. Now, if you look at the length of this seven-month-old baby, it's 62 centimeters, which is also following the same birth centile, but that is also in single, it is Madhyastha Mitiba. Again, it's not normal. Therefore, you need to go for the third chart. All these are there in the CHDR. So, that is weight for length, right? Now, if you check the weight for length, it is within the normal range, right? So, this child is following the birth centile, birth length centile, as well as birth weight centile, which is physiological and which needs to be encouraged. This baby does not have any illness, right? So, it's, it's the reassurance what matters. Why we reassure? Because there's a thing called Marker's Hypothesis. You would have learned this earlier as well. So the Barker described the fetal environmental and early infant health permanently programmed the body's metabolism and growth and thus determined the pathologies of old age. In simple terms, babies who are born small should follow the same centile. If they are crossing upwards, which means adding more and more fat tissue to the body, ended up in metabolic syndrome in later life. So the most physiological line for babies born with low birth weight would be to follow the same centile. And as healthcare professionals, our, our aim is to not to have low birth weight babies, right? Because it will add more problems in later life. Right. But in practice, what happens? Even if we say the mom, okay, this your baby does not have any problem. Mother will ask commonly three questions. Okay, doctor, can I, does my baby need three portions? Do you think my baby needs any multivitamin? Can you give something to increase the appetite of my baby? I know this baby may be normal according to you, but I need something. So let's see how to tackle these three problems. So for, to tackle these three problems, three questions, we need to know the indications of proportion. We need to know the multivitamin program in this country. And we need to know the evidence-based medicine regarding appetite stimulants in children. So I'm going to discuss these three. So let's look at multivitamin programs in this country. So we, now as general practitioners, you have to be very careful if you are going to prescribe a vitamin A containing multivitamin because all children in Sri Lanka, especially those who are in the government sector follow-up, are getting vitamin A mega dose every six monthly. Uh, Actually, this dose is now reduced to 50,000 international units. Uh, so basically, six months to 59 months, they all will be getting vitamin A. And then all children, except for low birth weight babies, will be getting a multiple micronutrient mineral mix powder. I know there are some, I mean, the program is discontinued at some stages. So it's a small sachet. 
So babies will be getting it from six months onwards up to 60 months consecutive, uh, sorry, uh, uh, I mean up to 18 months at two monthly intervals. It's two month duration. So 60 days, consecutive days at six, 12 and 18 months. So likewise, you can see iron supplementation and multivitamin drops for low birth, low birth weight babies and folic acid supplementation for low birth weight babies. And zinc is indicated in all children with diarrhea for about 14 days. Now, you need to check with mother, okay, is this baby getting any of these vitamins, right? If they are not getting these vitamins, especially this multiple micronutrient mineral mix uh, or iron, you may prescribe a multivitamin. Um, it, 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 there's no harm in it, right? There's no harm in it. But always prefer better to give a water-soluble vitamins than fat-soluble vitamins like A, D, E, K. There's a risk of getting hypervitaminosis with A, D, E, K. Be very careful to give vitamin D and take vitamin E. Children are getting vitamin A megadosis appropriately. So that is the answer for the vitamin. Um, right. Then mother might ask, okay, does this child need repotion? Now, even though Barker says you should not increase the, I mean, cross the birth centile upwards in our circular by the Family Health Bureau in 2016, this is the, uh, the latest circular which I could find. So there are three indications to give triposure to children. So one indication is weight for age below minus 2 ST is called underweight. Even for this baby, okay, triposure is indicated. The other indication is growth faltering in three consecutive months. So in, in, in subsequent slides, I will show you what is meant by growth faltering. And the third indication is weight for height between minus 2 ST and 3 ST, which is called moderate acute malnutrition or we call it MAM. So these are the three indications. So if you look at this babe who is seven months old, who has been following the birth centiles, but it's within the underweight range. So, okay, you can justify giving triposha. If triposha is not available, maybe suposha, which is also equivalent version in the market. So 50 grams per day is the recommended dose, right? So no harm in giving that or else uh, according to the circular, you need to give that, right? But don't aim to bring this baby into the ups, upper centiles than the birth center. Okay, then the next question is, can I get something to stimulate the appetite of my baby? Okay, now we get lots of medical representatives and they sell their product saying that this will increase the appetite. No. Now, one common preparation is ciproheptadine containing syrups. I'm not going to tell the brand names. Um, so this systematic reviews uh, has, an, has analyzed few papers uh, based on the ciproheptadine use to stimulate the appetite of baby. So the conclusion is, based on the literature review and studies completed to date, it is a safe drug, well-tolerated medication that has utility in helping facilitate weight gain in patients drawn from a variety of underweight population. So only few studies were there in this uh, kind of a meta-analysis. So it's like a systematic review, not a meta-analysis. So you need more studies to do, uh, I mean, come to a conclusion. But at the moment with the evidence, you might use, but not for longer period because the, some of these are antihistamines. It might increase the sedation uh, of the baby and might reduce the physical activities as well. And then most recently, lots of medical representatives are coming 
and selling their product that their multivitamin contains lysine. Now I took this photo from uh, another country. This product is not available. I could not put a product available in this country. If it is the case, I might promote that product. So lysine, I mean, it says it stimulates the appetite, but hardly any scientific uh, papers on this, right? Studies are on the way. Uh, so I really don't know whether we need to give lysine to stimulate appetite or not. But for ciproheptidine, there are few studies conducted in the past to suggest that there are some benefit. Right. Okay, let's move into another case. So a 10-month-old baby was brought by his mother with a concern of poor weight gain. There had been good weight gain till six months, and since then there is a weight fall. Now, this is the other common growth pattern in children. Soon after you start complementary feeding, they start to refuse the food, and then the weight will be flattened. And but rest of the examination looks unremarkable. No congenital heart disease, nothing, no hepatosplenomegaly, nothing. And always you need to put these parameters in the CHDR. Now, this is the growth pattern. The baby was born with a good birth weight and the birth centile was somewhere on plus one ST. Now, it has crossed three uh, centiles like. And now it is below minus 3. This is the weight for a child. It is not enough. So you need to check the length as well. If you look at the length, the baby is following the birth length centile, which is the plus 1 ST centile. So the length seems to be okay. But if you take the... Uh, Sorry. Now, if you look at the weight for Lynn, it is less than minus three standard deviation. Now, this growth pattern suggests that this baby has not got any chronic problem because the heart length gain is okay, right? Uh, yeah, you can see the length is okay, but there's weight faltering, which means this is something acute. Now, that's why your weight for length is in below minus three standard deviation. This is called Severe Acute Malnutrition, or SAM, this cannot be managed in the outpatient setup. This needs to be referred to a pediatrician, right? So when we get this kind of a baby, we evaluate this baby as a case of failure to thrive. But failure to thrive does not have universal definition. And so, if basically it means uh, it's used to describe children who are not growing as expected. If someone is not growing as we expect, so we can put them as uh, children with failure to thrive, right? So, different criteria. So, if it is weight for height minus two standard deviation, we, and in between two standard deviations to three standard deviation, we call Man, if it is more than less than three, we call SAM, CV acute malnutrition. Or else, even before that, if someone is crossing two major centiles and growth decelerations, faltering, and weight loss. Right? So I will show you a diagram in the next slide. And some of them may be illness related actually. After diarrheal illness, respiratory tract infection, children can go into this weight faltering category. Or sometimes it may be nutritional only. Now, what is meant by these weight faltering and different different terms? Now, if you look at this pattern, now weight faltering means in this phase, number one, 
in this area. Now, it is not like this, going like this. There's some deviation to this side. So that is called faltering. And then flattening means two subsequent weight measurements are the same, which is called flattening. And then the weight drop means there's a drop of it. This usually happens following illness. And then this period is called catch up growth. This is following usually diary after diary illness. You might see this pattern. Now, the faltering, flattening, drop, all these three uh, types can be broadly labeled as child with failure to thrive. Right? Uh, some of them might have a catch-up growth period. Some of them might not. Right? Now, if we... Now, we might identify babies with severe acute malnutrition at some of these stages, one, two, or four. And when they come... So, the management is BP100. In, in, in summary, it's BP100, uh, which is available only in the hospital sector. But now, I know in some times, in MOH offices with the pediatrician's uh, involvement, there's some distribution of BP-100. Uh, so children with CV acute malnutrition should be referred to the pediatrician. Now, in case if you get a chil uh, child with a moderate acute malnutrition, which means if the weight to height or weight for length lies between minus two SD to minus three SD, so you can manage at your setup with proportion, right? Right. Now let's go to the other scenario. A 12 year old girl was brought by parents uh, with a concern of poor weight gain and there's no weight loss. So it has to be she. She remains otherwise well. She was born with a birth weight of 2.7 and has been following the same centile till five years of age. Um, Let's see what, yeah, it has to be her, right? Her weight is 25 and the height is 140 centimeters. Now, this is a frequent problem. Now, children might come to the general practice for something else. And before they leave, they might just ask you, okay, doctor, is there any problem with my child's weight gain? Now, how old is the child? Child is 12 years. Okay. Now, when you check the weight, it is 25 kilograms and the height is 140. Now, when you look at the CHDR, you can't find weight for age chart after five years. Even in the WHO growth charts, which are fr freely available in the internet in PDF forms, again, weight for age chart is not available after 10 years. So what does it mean? So basically, you don't, I mean, you can ask parents to not to worry about your child's weight after five years. Or especially after 10 years, don't think about the weight. But you need to worry about the height and the BMI. Now, the reason behind not worrying about the weight after five or maybe after 10 years of age because during adolescence, growth patterns can vary widely due to factors such as puberty, genetics, lifestyle, and nutrition. Um, so WHO recommendation to assess height for age and BMI chart after five years. So those two charts are available in the CHDR. Now, if I put this child's Uh, this child's height, there may be some changes with the sex, so don't worry about it. Now, this child, uh, his weight, uh, sorry, the height is 140 centimeters, so which is between minus 1 SD to minus 2 SD. If you look at the BMI, it is minus 2 SD to minus 3 SD. Now, is it an illness? Right now, if you look at this BMI chart, you have obesity here. The same chart is available in our CHDR. And you have a category called overweight. And you have a category called normal. And you have 
category called thinness and severe thinness. In Sinhala, this is called Prusha Bhava and Ugra Prusha Bhava. After five years, even though we diagnose thinness and severe thinness, hardly any nutritional rehabilitation program described in the world. I mean, Triposha is not indicated. BP100 is not indicated. So basically, we need to closely monitor their height and we need to check whether they are getting adequate nutrition. That's it. Hardly any therapeutic nutritional programs available in this particular age. So if you get, in summary, if you get a mom with a child, uh, uh, I mean, with some concern about the weight after five years of age, so stop at that point. Please check the height and the BMI. If height is within the normal range, you don't need to worry. If they comes under thinness and severe thinness, you might look for micronutrient deficiencies and um, get some dietary recall and see what's going on and might need to arrange some follow-up. That's it. So this child is in the category of thinness. So hardly any nutritional intervention other than a balanced diet and the protein dietary adverts, right? Okay, now let's move on. This is a true story. This patient, uh, when I was a registrar in Madara Hospital, I got this patient to pediatric clinic, actually. A 12-year-old girl was brought by the parents with a concern of short stature. Uh, I think, again, there's a problem with the sex of the child. So she is the shortest child in the class, and also she is shorter than her 10-year-old sister, So which is very important. If someone is shorter than the younger sibling or the same sex, um, so it is something you need to consider seriously. So she's on average Sri Lankan diet, no chronic diarrhea vomiting. Her weight is 26.2 and height is 120. It doesn't mean anything to you unless you put this data on the chart. Now, this is the this is our chart, CHTR. Now it's not only one parameter, you need to see the trajectory. In the tra trajectory, you can see child was in the normal height range at the age of maybe five, six, seven, and it was slowly crossing, and now she is below minus two standard deviations. If you look at this child's the BMI, it is normal, but there's a problem child has got short stature, which means height less than minus 2SD. This is defined as short stature, right? BMI normal. Okay, that's fine, but you need to do something. Now, let's see how are we going to approach to a child with short stature. Now, most of the things you can do in your setup. So, short stature by definition, if someone has got height more than minus two standard deviation, always use standard deviations. That is what we use in Sri Lanka. You might find different growth charts in wards and in sometimes in other places. Sometimes drug representatives might give you different growth charts. But for Sri Lankans, we always need the CHDR growth charts or the WHO recommended charts. Um, so usually the pre-pubertal children, we need at least four centimeter per year height gain, right? Now the causes for short stature could be pathological or it may be physiological. Um, if parents are also short, it may be a physiological cause. Or sometimes it may be proportionate or it may be disproportionate. You might see people with echondroplasia and um, some skeletal dysplasia. They, they don't have proportionate short, short stature. And sometimes it may be associated with syndromes, right? So causes of short stature, common causes of familial short stature. 
IUGR and prematurity means in return growth retardation and prematurity is a cause of short stature. And this is something you need to know, constitutionally delayed growth and puberty. And the nutritional problems, psychosocial deprivations, endocrine causes like hypothyroidism, growth hormone deficiency, Cushing syndrome, underlying chronic illnesses, and urine to short stature, and syndromes. So in the history, you need to get the birth history, dietary history, and parental ages at their puberty, stresses, and always look for um, features of intracranial malignancies like pituitary tumors can give rise to short stature and um, features of malabsorption, features of hypothyroidism and then you need to do the examination and few investigations even at your level you can do. So the examination is very easy in a child with short stature. Uh, you start with looking at now you can concentrate on this first. So you can look for dysmorphism and midline defects because in hypopituitarism you might see midline problems and you can look for a goiter and some features of hypothyroidism and uh, cardiovascular system examination is important especially if you see a female, short female with a murmur compatible with coarctation of hyotide may be a case of Turner syndrome. Um, so, respiratory system examination is important. Um, and in CNS, visual field defects. Bitemporal hemianopia is a feature of pituitary tumors. So, in this um, uh, diagram, there are different maneuvers you have to do. Uh, now, mainly, um. so you need to check the height and then upper segment to lower segment ratio right and then the arm span is important and you need to see whether there's any asymmetry in hands uh, because in silver russell syndrome there will be asymmetry so likewise there are different things some of these are not kind of beyond your level uh, because it might need so it doesn't mean you need to do everything, but if you can do at least the upper segment and lower segment ratio and the arm span, you can narrow down most of the differentials. Now, what is the importance of upper segment to lower segment ratio? As I told at the beginning, at birth, the upper segment is uh, longer than the lower segment. But what happens when they grow old? Now, this is important. By about seven years, the upper segment to lower segment ratio is equal. By about 18 years, it is upper segment is shorter than uh, the lower segment. So, it is the, usually the trouser is longer than the shirt, right? So, in adults, that is the case. But in children, the shirt is, the top is longer than the trouser, right? Now, if you see, if someone is maintaining this body proportion, so we call it the proportionate short stature. But if in some syndromes, in children with achondroplasia, like they might have the persistently longer upper segment even in adulthood. Now, now in these conditions, even in hypothyroidism, they will have longer upper segment so basically if someone is having infantile body proportions you need to think of these skeletal dysplasias uh, and some other syndromes right and if if it is the early reversal now if in younger age if they get the older pattern again there are syndromes right so basically at your level, if you identify a disproportionate short stature, which needs to be referred to a pediatrician, this can be done in the GP practice. Now, if you get a child with a concern of short stature, you need to know, okay, whether this child has got short stature or not. So for that, you need to measure the height. And if it is less than minus 2ST, you can label it as short stature. 
and then look at the birth weight, birth length, and then the mid parental height, which I'm going to do uh, in the next slide, right? And look for an illness. So what is mid parental height? So mid parental height is the next most important thing. You can do it in your GP practice. So you need to get the mother's height and the father's height plus 12.5 centimeters divided by two for boys. So boys, it's plus 12.5. Girls, it's minus 12.5. You might get a figure. Let's put it as X. So plus or minus 8.5 centimeter means the mid parental height range. So which means if you get a figure of 150 and plus 8.5 means 158.5 and minus 8.5 means 141.5. Now, this is the tallest child these parents can produce. This is the shortest child these parents can produce. So, if they lie in between, so that means they are followed within the mid parental height. Now, you get a child below minus 2SD, but they are within the mid parental height. You need to uh, worry. Right? But there are some basic investigations you might have to do, and the indications are uh, given like full blood count, renal functions, electrolytes, sometimes the inflammatory markers. But this is the next important thing that is bone age. The first thing to de determine whether the child is short or not. Second thing, are they within the mid parental height? Third thing, whether the skeletal maturation is okay. Now, bone age means simply an X-ray of a left hand to see how many carpal bones are there. At birth, children, babies are born with two carpal bones. By about uh, adolescence, they get all the carpal bones. Right? So, bone age determines the ossification. I mean, provides an estimate of a child's skeletal mass maturation by assessing the ossification of the epiphyseal centers. Uh, so basically it gives the child's growth potential, right? And it, it can predict the adult height. So frontal radiograph of the left hand and wrist. I think up to this level, you can evaluate a baby a child with short stature. Um, so if it is delayed, now you need to send this to a radiologist to report it in a proper way. But pediatric endocrinologists, they do it by themselves. Um, so if it is significantly delayed or less than minus, I mean, two standard deviations, you call it a delayed bone age. Now let's see clinical importance of bone age. If someone has got short stature, uh, but the bone age is normal, they are within the mid parental height, so it is highly likely a familial short stature. You might get someone who has got short stature even below mid parental height, but the bone age is not that delayed. So that is usually constitutional delay. I will show you a growth tra trajectory later. Now you might get a child who is short even below mid parental height, and the bone age is significantly delayed. So this needs to be referred urgently. It may be a case of even a brain tumor. Sometimes you might get children with short stature with advanced bone age. As I told you earlier, if someone is born into precocious puberty, they will end up with short stature in the adult life. Right? Now what happened to this child, this baby was evaluated, child was evaluated, height was below mid parent height, bone weight was 8 years and 6 months at the age of 12 years of chronological age and the T4TSH was in favor of the diagnosis of hypothyroidism. This child has got actually acquired hypothyroidism for a few years which was undetected and child was started on thyroxine. 
Now let's look at some of the growth charts to see other causes of short stature. Now in this growth chart, you can see concentrate only in this area. Now you will get this child at one point. But imagine this child came at the age of 12 years to you. And when you check the height, okay, it is short, but it is within the mid-parental height. Right? To confirm, done the bone age. Bone age is also not that delayed. It's 11 plus in a 12-year-old, so it's not that delayed. And then, if you look at the weight of the child, which is also following relatively okay, right? So this means that they are short compared to peers within the mid-parent height, normal upper segment to lower segment ratio at that date, normal bone age. So this is familial short stature. Child will be short, but it is well with, within the mid-parental height range. Now, let's look at this case. You get a child 14 years of age. Child is short. And if you look at the mid-parental height, yes, it's below the mid-parental height. Short compared to peers, and there's a family history of delayed puberty. And weight, no significant weight faltering, I would say. Only one percentile. And normal upper segment to lower segment ratio. Bone age, you can see bone age is here. At the age of 14 years, the bone age is 10 plus. It's significantly delayed, but not that delayed, I would say. Uh, so this is constitutional delay of growth and puberty. This needs to be referred to a pediatric endocrinologist, preferably, if not even a pediatrician. Um, might need few close follow-up. Some children will be benefited with some uh, intramuscular testosterone injection for some other sex hormones in females. So, but you need to understand this is, these children will achieve the final height, normal final height late. Right. So next case, uh, a 12 year old girl, a boy with asthma presents with a history of cough and runny nose. Uh, he has no respiratory distress or we seen the diagnosis was made as common cold and given symptomatic management. On examination, he seems to be overweight for his age. I mean, no parent will come and tell you, my child is overweight, please look at this child. It, it's very less compared to the complaining of uh, underweight. But it is something you need to pick up. The weight is 55, height is 140, BMI is 28. If you look at this chart, the height is okay. BMI, it's in the obese range. So this child is obese, right? So definitely then what are we going to do with overweight and obesity? So I, I will rush this. Um, so the definition varies with age. The WHO definition, uh, less than five-year-old children, you need to take weight for height or weight for length. If it is plus 2 SD, you call overweight, plus 3 SD, you call obesity. If it is children between 5 to 19 years, now see this difference. Overweight is defined with plus 1 SD with BMI. Weight for height, overweight is defined with plus 2 SD. Obesity is defined with plus 2 SD in BMI. Weight for height chart, less than five years, it's three years. It's somewhat confusing, but you need to know the correct definition. After 90, 19 years, it's the adult, right? About 25, you call overweight, about 30, you call obesity. But BMI is not the best measurement for the adiposity. Ideally speaking, you need to assess the body fat content. If it is more than 25% in boys and more than 32% in girls, uh, it is called uh, obesity. So this is the machine to assess the body fat composition. So in what you need to differentiate is whether this is a simple obesity or not. 
if it is simple obesity, the cardinal feature is the normal height. Right? And they should not have any syndromic features. Right? They will be like that. But in pathological obesity, they will have short stature. Now that is now this is what you need to know. Right? So they will have some other features. Now, there are lots of comorbidities like cardiovascular system, endocrine, gastrointestinal, neurological system. And skeletal problems are there, psychological problems and pulmonary problems, especially asthma, right? Children with obesity can get asthma. Uh, so investigations-wise, at your level, you, you can do fasting blood sugar and even a lipid profile is justifiable. ALT, AST is important to assess any level of fatty liver and sometimes OGTT which probably at not your level and ultrasound scan of the abdomen is important to look for the fatty liver and sometimes rarely bone age um, most of the time investigations are not needed so the management is mainly the behavioral modification and this is something important those who are at the pre-pubertal level our aim is to maintain static weight rather than losing weight because when they get the pubertal growth spurt, their BMI will be improved. But children who have passed the pubertal growth spurt need to lose weight. So unlike in adults, we don't advise children to lose weight in the way we do in adults, right? Uh, so it's it's somewhat slowly uh, slow process, right? So that is the target BMI diet. I'm not going to do a lot, but do not eat refined carbohydrate and food. Do not skip meals. Do not eat small portions of food throughout the day, and do not consume fizzy sweetened beverages, right? So that's the other thing. So last. No more than five minutes. So this child is a uh, patient uh, came to the clinic. He's a 12-year-old boy, came for the routine asthma follow-up. He's under ophthalmologist. So you can see he's wearing uh, spectacles. The weight is 36.2, height is 175. And again, no parent will come and complain you that my child is taller than peers. They will think it as an advantage, yes, in most cases, yes. But if you look at this child, okay, height is well above uh, the three standard deviations. And if you see such a patient, you need to uh, think of at least these four conditions. Like it may be familial, if both parents are told, it may be the case. But in Marfan syndrome, Children, they can have this pectus carinatum and long fingers. You call it them as marfanoid body habitus because they may be wearing spectacles and they can have scoliosis. Why you need to be vigilant on this? Because of the heart. So why you are worried about a child with tall stature? It may be due to uh, anything else but main thing is the heart because they can have aortic root dilatations and mitral valve prolapse which need some evaluation right um so actually this child is a child with homocystinuria uh, you can completely forget forget about the condition but at your level i think that you need to look for features of marfanoid body habitus and probably do a 2D echocardiogram to just to exclude any underlying mitral valve prolapse or uh, aortic root dilatation. Right, then one slide on pubertal related, two slides, I think, pubert related disorders. So you need to know the normal puberty because again, this is a problem in our country because sometimes parents might celebrate isolated menarche in their children because the moment it happens they might go to an astrologist and look at the k in the ray and then they say okay this is the correct time to attain puberty 
But when you look at, it's a six-year-old girl who has not got any breast bud, no pubic hair, only one spot, one or two spots of blood to vagina. It can't be puberty because a puberty means you need to start with the breast bud and then the pubic hair. And then after two to two and a half years of breast bud only, someone get menarche. So don't believe uh, of such a history given by parents. So usually females, they get early puberty than males. So in males, testicular growth is the um, earliest sign. It should be more than four milliliters. You need to have ochidometer to measure this. If you don't have ochidometer, the for longest diameter can be taken into account. If it is more than 2.5 centimeter, you call it the child is in puberty. And then you can see pubic hair and then the axillary hair. Right. So what you need to know is what is meant by precocious puberty. If the onset of secondary sexual characteristics, which means the breast buds before the age of eight years in female and this testicular volume increment before nine years in male, considered as precocious puberty. What is meant by delayed puberty? Failure of development of any pubertal features. Even at the age of 13 years in a female, if you don't see breast buds, so that is delayed puberty. If you don't see any scrotal I and mean the testicular enlargement by 14 years of age, it is delayed puberty. Both these two conditions needs to be referred to a pediatric endocrinologist if available, if not to a pediatrician. So both these conditions needs to be evaluated. So in take home message, So always follow the growth trajectory because otherwise if you do not know the birth weight of the child, you can't just assess the snapshot assessments. So always look at the previous growth records. The baby should grow along their birth centile. Don't blame parents uh, for having babies in this orange and red zones. Uh, it may be their normal growth potential. So less than five years, please use these three charts, weight for a chart, length or height for a chart, and weight for height chart. And after five years, you are given two charts, that is height for age and BMI. Now, I used to keep my own growth charts. I have photocopied charts with me. Um, so if you can have these charts at your... GP practice, that's the best because sometimes parents might not bring the growth charts with them. And always check mid parent height and plotting charts when evaluating a child with short stature. With that, if the child is within the mid parent height, you don't need, need to do anything other than maybe checking the height again in six months' time. If there's two centimeter height gain over a period of six months, that's enough. But for all these things, you need to have these tools. I think it's a good investment if you can have proper tools with you, at least a stadiometer and these weighing scales uh, and the length tools. And always get a print of these five charts. So five means one six it's five and the boys again five so ten charts this is weight for a chart this is height or the length for a chart this is weight for a height chart this is the bmi sorry the height for a chart after five years this is the bmi now if you have these charts and these tools with you now most of these growth related problems can be identified, diagnosed, reassured, and when necessary, you can refer. Right, I think that's it. And thank you very much for listening to me. More than 
I think I, I took more than 10 more minutes, right? If you have any questions, you can put in the chat box. Yeah, still, I think uh, we can spare a few minutes if you have any yeah. questions. Yeah, yeah. If you have any questions, you can unmute your mics and um, forward your questions. Okay, please explain growth phases again. Well, I will just share this slide. Yeah. So basically, it's these are the four growth phases: the fetal, infantile, childhood, pubertal. In different growth phases, different factors dominate, right? Hormones come into play in this period. Um, yeah, any other questions? I mean, if you want, I can share the lecture note with you. So actually, we will be sharing the uh, recording of the lecture in the YouTube channel just after the um, lecture. All right. Okay. Uh, when calculating mid parental height, is it wrong to add or subtract? Well, so thirteen is okay. I mean, twelve point five. Because in some formulas, in some charts, you can find even thirteen. But the one we use is twelve point five actually. But what what is important is you get one value. So add 8.5 into it and get minus 8.5. So you, you always need a range with parent height range. Okay, Um. in the absence of any more questions, I think uh, we can wind up for today's uh, session. And uh, Dr. Marka, um, thank you, sir. Thank you immensely for your superb lecture on the recognition and management of pediatric growth disorders. Actually, it really was an eye-opener for us as uh, primary care physicians. And I want to thank Dr. Prabhat Nanakara, our assistant secretary of the college for arranging this lecture for us. And um, dear participants, uh, this lecture will be available on our YouTube channel. Um, it will be available in about one and hour, one hour. And uh, we have another good news. There will be another CPD event for this month that would be on this uh, 30th. It will be on ECGs by uh, Dr. Nishan Vas Gunawadhan, consultant interventional cardiologist. And we will share the link and the flyer tomorrow. So hope um, you will be uh, joining with us for that uh, lecture as well. And uh, once again, before we wind up, I would like to remind you to fill the Google form to obtain the certificate. So thank you. Thank you all.